homeschooling, and then we can ask, we can just discuss it, all right? Ask questions. Uh, I got interested in homeschooling a long time ago. My wife and I didn't want our children to attend the public schools. Uh, the oldest of them is now 22, so that was quite a while ago. And the, our impetus for being in homeschooling was about the same as that of most of the people in the movement. They were mostly Christian people who didn't want their children immersed in the degraded social environment in the public schools. We weren't really concerned about academics, but the other things. And I think that's driven a lot of the homeschool movement, especially, I think that's still the main driving force in the homeschool movement. Uh, so we, we lived in rural Oregon on a small farm, and uh, we we're both scientists. We did our science on the farm as well. We have a little laboratory, and my wife taught the students in about the same way that uh, most homeschools operate. Uh, we got materials from various sources. Some people become completely convinced that one source of materials is good and they follow that curriculum. Other people uh, will mix together different ones. My wife mixed together different ones. She'd get material from Becca, material from Bob Jones, material from an organization called Cardin. There was a lady at, uh, that uh, did a Cardin curriculum. And then she'd go to the Christian bookstore and mix in all sorts of things to turn it into a Christian, a more Christian curriculum, built the curriculum she wanted. And she filled several filing cabinets with the materials. And we were always concerned that we might not be able to afford the materials when the time came, so she kept buying them ahead. <clears throat> and there were six children, so we had a complete curriculum for six kids, all the workbooks and everything. And uh, it w worked out very well. I think she was doing a good job of teaching them. But then uh, about 10 years ago, she died. And there were, uh, at that time, the oldest was 12 and the youngest was one and a half. So uh, the uh, only one of them is here tonight, Noah, who's the second, uh, second oldest. Noah's 20. And so the, uh, the home school had to change because there wasn't any teacher. And as all, although I did my work on the farm uh, not, and in the laboratory there and at my desk, I didn't have time to be a teacher. And maybe not the inclination either. I used to teach at the university. I taught chemistry at the University of California, San Diego as a professor, but that's different from teaching little kids. And I don't know, you know whether I would have had the patience to teach little kids properly. In any case, I decided we'd continue with the home school because putting them in the public schools was unthinkable. But uh, I had to do it differently. So what I did, well, there was, a, there was a, sort of an old uh, uh, wooden building beside the house. I converted that into a schoolroom. I gave each of them a large desk. I'm, I'm an advocate of a child having a comfortable chair and a great big desk to work at each one um, with nothing on the desk except his schoolwork. And so I g gave each of them that in that room, uh, five of them. The six was one and a half, so the other five would take turns, one hour off, on, and four hours off, taking care of him somewhere else. And I put the five in there, each with a desk, and my desk was in there. And I think this is a good idea because uh, it's good to set an example for the student. If you're doing desk work, he's doing desk work. In addition, you're there. And if they're younger kids, they need uh, some adult present. They shouldn't be making racket, but there's probably necessary for young children to at least have adult presence, so they're a little reminded that they, that they should be disciplined. So I gave them each a desk, and then the question was uh, how to teach them. And I looked through the materials that she had, and the first thing I did was pick up the Saxon math books, that was a well-organized thing. And I think it's a good idea to start off the day with, uh, with something that's good mental discipline anyway. So I said, well, each of you do a, a lesson in Saxon math book in the morning, and then we'll go on from there. And I gradually added things, uh, a little writing, a little reading, and, and books that we had. We had sort of a, a large library, so I'd pick things out. In any case, the, the method just consisted of putting things in front of them and uh, having them study them. But uh, not, with, uh, uh, not with any workbooks, and emphasizing primarily uh, study habits and self-discipline in study. Uh, this has evolved over the years into something that seems to work very well, and that's what we have in that little Robinson curriculum we put together. The, uh, and so getting away from the history of it or going to what it consists of today in the way I think is a very good way to teach, uh, the main things you're teaching are the main responsibility of the parent. In this method, where there's very little parental involvement, the child doesn't, uh, I mean, the parent doesn't do very much, 
but you do have to enforce the rules. You have to make sure the child develops good study habits in a good study environment. And once you've done that, then it's a question of just putting high quality materials in front of them to learn. Now you organize them so that they're getting the easier things, the next harder and the next harder and so forth. But really knowledge is in books. People sometimes look at the kind of curriculum that we do and they say, well, that's just books. But that's where knowledge is. It's not on the video games. It's not in the TV set. It's not in some kind of funny manipulative they get to play with. It's in books. And moreover, in the English language, we have a heritage of hundreds and hundreds of years of extraordinary books. Uh, so if you go back into, say, 500 years of English literature and history and so forth, and have your pick of all of that, you can find the greatest writers in the English language for your history and your English and so forth. And then for science and mathematics, you have to come more to the present. You do come more to the present. You don't have to because the math is, most of the math is several hundred years old too. And the science uh, that a child learns, if he learns good science and physics, the physics he learns is 300 years old. Uh, the chemistry is a little more modern, perhaps 150 years old. There's very little that you teach a child if you're teaching him fundamentals up to the age of 18 that's not at least a century old, except for just current events and most recent history. But uh, what's most important is to learn to learn. And uh, a schedule that uh, I advocate is that the child gets, and this is the way our little homeschool works, or is supposed to work. We don't always follow the rules, but we should. <clears throat> they each have a desk of their own, and they get up in the morning. Some people get, some children get up at 6, and some of them get up at 9, depending on their inclination or what it is they have planned for the day. It's up to them. But their brain knows that the first thing you do when you get up in the morning, six days a week, is you work a lesson of sacks of math. Between you and the rest of your day are 30 sacks of math problems. There's no choice. That's what's there. Uh, if you, now, if you might have only 10 or 15, or you might have 60, we meter the math according to uh, how difficult it is for the child at a given time. Um, I advocate that they uh, get 95% of the problems right on the first pass, and then they look up the answers and correct their own work. But that uh, you mustn't go too fast in mathematics, or you don't you miss something, and you can't build on it. So what we do is to say that the child should work a third of a lesson, a half a lesson, a full lesson, or two lessons a day, providing that he doesn't spend more more than two or three hours on math, and providing that he gets 95% or right more right on the first pass. So if it's going easy for him, he's doing two lessons a day. If it's very hard, he's doing half a lesson or a third of a lesson. And this doesn't necessarily a function of whether he's a good math student or not. It's a function of whether that particular math is difficult. The best math student I have is, our, is my daughter Bethany. She's 16 now, but she finished calculus at 14. She was a very, very good math student. But sometimes she was doing half a lesson a day. She got to something that was hard for her, and she had to be slowed down, and vice versa, speed it up. And of poor students, the same thing. But there's plenty of time to, most children should be able to finish calculus by the time they're 16, and this works out very well if they do this kind of program from an earlier age. Interestingly, the, most of the people that are picking, there are about 25,000 kids around the country using this curriculum that we, we kind of box this program and, and uh, distribute it. About 25,000 kids using it, and most of them are parents that have been homeschooling for a long time. Most of them pick it up because they get burned out trying to do everything at once and be a teacher of everything and the mother is completely wiped out homeschooling and they find that this does a better job with le very little time so they like to adapt to it. And when they do that, if you come in halfway, then sometimes the student is, can't finish his math that early because he's been stuck in poorer math. There are several things I, uh, that uh, I think are of special interest. One is academics. Now, the homeschool movement's definitely not been driven by academics. It's been driven by uh, sociological factors. There's no question about it. They're, most homeschoolers are trying to keep their kids away from the decay, the peer group decay in our society. Uh, and it, it, to me, it's, it's just astonishing how bad it is. And at college, it gets worse. It's almost uh, uh, what's present in our universities today, except in the sciences, is almost not fit for human life. It's just beyond belief what's, what's in these courses. And, but, so that's a very powerful motivation. Academics has not driven the homeschool movement very much, that is, academic quality. You know if you go back 
even in the history of the public schools. Socialism doesn't work, but it often takes a long time for it to fail. So if you go back uh, two or three generations in our public schools, you find something entirely different. You find uh, academic quality that's much higher. Sometimes you see in the Wall Street Journal or some other place, they'll show a, a, uh, an examination from the 10th grade 100 years ago. And you look at it, you, you barely read the questions. You know you can't pass the test. <laughs> the the uh, uh, quality was high. And in fact, if you go back into American heritage, uh, talking about the humanities, the sentence structure, vocabulary, syntax, and so forth with which people wrote and, and wrote in the early days of the Republic, it's really remarkable. Uh, I, uh, we put some of this in our curriculum, but one thing we don't have, my, my 11-year-old boy was uh, reading a book the other day. What are you reading? We said, I'm reading the autobiography of Daniel Boone. Someone had reprinted this. It was a reprint. It was astonishing. So he gave this to me, and I read it. After I read a couple of paragraphs, I was just laughing. And the reason was that it was so erudite. This was fantastic. The vocabulary and sentence structure in the first two paragraphs of Daniel Boone's autobiography would probably be criticized in a writing course in an American university today as being too complicated and difficult to read. You're not supposed to reuse words that big. But Daniel Boone was an Indian fighter. This guy was, I mean, this is no academic and no intellectual. What he's writing about is, is brutal. He was one of the first two white men to see Kentucky. He's writing about being captured by the Indians. This guy lived an incredible life and had nothing to do with academics. Yet he wrote uh, much better than a university professor here writes today. And that's true of our whole heritage. Go back and read newspapers 150 years ago. It's just a whole different thing. So, and it is an advantage then in reading older books in this way, but in any case, this uh, academic quality has decayed badly over the years. And even in the present time, if you go back to the 1960s, you find that uh, the uh, public schools were about two grade levels ahead of what they are today. I think this was best expressed to me once by a barber in Cave Junction. I live near this little town of Cave Junction, and there's this barber in there. And there's a guy about 35. I went in there one day, he was cutting my hair, and he says, you know, I'm halfway through college, and I figure if I keep cutting hair the rest of my life, I'll have a PhD. He has, a, he has graduated from the Cave Junction High School. But since he graduated, the, public, the schools have degraded another two grades. So he figures he's halfway through college. And if they keep going down, he'll have a PhD before he's through. And it may be right. Uh, we, the Noah and his older brother, Zachary, both skipped two years of college and uh, entered as juniors. His brother got his degree in chemistry, and Noah will do the same thing. So, so you can brag. Your two sons were so came out of their home school, skipped two years of college, and got very good great records and graduated in a science in two years. But the truth is, those two boys got nothing but a good high school education. Uh, the first two years of college, even in science, even among the good students today, is nothing more than was being taught to high school students when I went to school, and I'm not that old. Uh, it's uh, just terrible, this degradation. My son, Zachary, who's a graduate student at Iowa State, told me today, he's, it's the first year in graduate school, he says he's going to have 100 students as, as a teaching, he has, has to do a teaching assistantship. And uh, he says, I have the advanced classes. Uh, that means that the students in my classes have had at least two months of algebra when they were in public schools before they went there. This is just beyond belief. They cannot do physics. They probably can't do chemistry. And when I taught at UC San Diego in the 70s, the uh, main thing that was wrong with the 300 students in my freshman chemistry class was they couldn't do algebra. They couldn't do simple mathematics, and therefore they didn't have a chance to do science. Now, there's this is sort of papered over. I'm getting, I'll bounce around, but we'll talk about things I think that may be of interest. Uh, this is papered over. People say, well, when, what does your curriculum have? And I refer to that, but it's not just because we're, we sell those CD-ROMs, but we've tried to build a curriculum we think is a good one, and it gives an idea of what we think should be taught. They say, what do you have in science for 10-year-olds? There's no science for 10-year-olds. You can't do science without mathematics, and you can't learn the mathematics behind science by the time you're 10, unless you're a certified genius. Uh, there's extracurricular things for 10-year-olds. A 10-year-old who's precocious might have a chemistry set. Any 10-year-old who's curious is likely to have some hobby that's, that's science in nature. Like his older brother loved ants. He was running around chasing ants when he was 10 years old, studying ants. I eventually got him the best books I could on ants. 
and I mean the best books. It isn't necessary to get something about, you know, Joe Ant and his, uh, and his little, and, and that, that sort of uh, makes a person out of him. When Zachary was uh, a little boy, he loved ants. I got him the best book on ants, uh, as far as I know, is in print by a couple of men that are world experts on ants. It's a beautiful book, huge, thick thing. At that age, you could only read half of it. But there are a lot of pictures. He could read part of it. But it gave you two things. First, it gave him a lot of pretty pictures of ants and a book to read, you know, and look through. But plus, it said, this is ants. This is your subject, the subject you're interested in, as it is studied by the people who love this subject the most, who know it the best. You may need a PhD before you can read this whole book, but this is the way that ants are studied. This is the level at which the knowledge is. Work hard, and someday you'll be able to read the whole book. That's better, because that teaches the student that there's something to strive for. Uh, uh, if he's interested in electronics, you can make a student into a ham radio operator. All of us at our house, the six kids and I are all ham radio operators because we live in a rural area. We all got uh, at least two meter radio licenses, uh, the, the little, smallest license, so we could all carry a two meter radio. This gives us instant communication with each other. If the girls are out riding their horses, I can know that they can talk to me if they have an accident or whatever. Now we've got a lot more licenses, but most of us just have a simple one. But uh, if he's interested in electronics, he'd make a ham radio operator out of him. He may put together radios and do little kits and stuff. He doesn't understand it. He won't understand it until he takes physics. But it's a neat hobby and so on. But I think science is an extracurricular activity until a child knows enough math. But that's not the way it's handled in our schools. They want everybody to know science. What they really know is some propaganda. They're they're trying to uh, lie to them about global warming or ozone holes or some sort of nonsense that the socialists like. And they tell the little kids, this is your science class. Learn that the oil companies are destroying the environment or some other thing that they want to propagandize about. But there isn't any science there. They're not able to think because they don't know any math. They can't do the subject. You have to know the math before you can do the science. And you have to know algebra before you can do any chemistry at all. And you have to know calculus before you can do any reasonable physics. But there are a lot of other lies that are told along the way in designing a curriculum that still sounds good in the public schools. Uh, one lie, you don't need to know the math. Two, that we'll teach you science when you're 10 years old. Uh, the math in, in physics is especially interesting to me. Uh, we use these Saxon math books. We really like them. Incidentally, uh, John Saxon thought these books could not possibly be used without a teacher. He argued with me about this. I told him they could. He didn't believe me. And yet I know now thousands of students that are using them without a teacher. They're beautifully written, very, very nice. But he thought they were for a teacher. Uh, in any case, he also has a physics book, Saxon Physics. And we don't use that at all. It has no calculus in it. It's just algebra. And it's kind of fake physics. Uh, but you're taught they, they can't teach, they don't teach calculus to the students. It's not that hard. It's just the next math after algebra and, and uh, some fancy geometry. They don't teach this to them, and yet they want to pretend they taught physics. So they say, well, we have a non-calculus physics for you here. Well, this is a problem. Isaac Newton in invented all the, everything you learn in freshman physics, in beginning physics, was invented by Isaac Newton. He started and he finished it. It took him about two years. And when he was finished, the physics was done. Somebody asked Newton why he, he wrote his physics book in Latin and his optics book in English. He said, well, I wanted people to be able to read the optics more easily because there's more yet to do there, but physics is finished. And it was. When he finished, all the mechanics was done. And that's all you teach in beginning physics is Newtonian mechanics. Well, Isaac Newton had to invent calculus while he was inventing physics because he couldn't do physics without calculus. Isaac Newton couldn't do it without calculus, but your kid can that doesn't make any sense, but this is another story they tell in order to not teach the math that is necessary for the science. Anyway, uh, what's most important, besides having good materials, remember they're going to kids, you're going to learn all your life, and you don't know at an early age what you're going to specialize in or anything, so you really don't know what specific knowledge you will need for your profession. You don't know what your general interests are, so you really don't know what general interests of literature or history or other things that you will be involved in during your life. But you do know that you will need to know how to learn throughout your life. So the first thing I think is most important to teach a child is study habits 
and a <laughs> mental attitude that he can extract material from books and use it. That's more important than what he's extracting. Uh, and then to put in front of them those things which are tools that should be learned at an early age because they underlie everything else. So if a kid starts out the day with mathematics and he has to solve about 30 problems, then uh, that starts his day off right, starts it in a sober, thoughtful way. If you started by working two, two hours of math in the day, the rest of your day is an entirely different kind of day because your mind is in a different sort of mode. Plus, you learn self-confidence. You learn that you can sit down and work them. It's very important not to take this away from the child by helping him. Uh, if Matthew, who's 11, the others have had the same experience, he looks over, he rarely does this because he doesn't get anything out of it, but he looks over me and he says, I can't work this problem. There's only one answer he'll be given. Well, you'll just have to keep studying until you can, won't you? I've never, ever shown him how to work a problem, nor the other kids have I. Because problem solving, this is another thing. People will call up and say, well, do you have a solutions manual that goes with the Saxon math book? That's the thing that works out the problem for the teacher so she can show the student how to do it. Well, this is a useless thing because you're not memorizing how to work problem, a specific problem. In fact, if you show the student how to work the problem, you have deprived him of the good of that problem. He gets nothing out of that problem now. You can, I mean, I might as well never have seen it. Because what he's learning is mentally how to work problems, not memorizing how they're worked. And this can become kind of ridiculous. I mean, in, in, the, you get, in the university, you get kids that are trained in the normal way, a times B equals C. You give them A and B and they calculate C in the problem you show them during the class. You give them A and C on the exam and ask for B and they complain they haven't seen one like that before because it's a, a different it's a permutation. There are millions and millions of different simple math problems. And what you learn is how to work problems, not the solutions to problems. And so showing the child how to work the problem is doubly bad. One you uh, deprive him of the value of that problem, but more importantly, you give him a mindset such that, that math consists of try it, and if you can't work it, ask a nice person to show you how. This is awful. Your mind should know that there's the child's mind, and I'm talking about from the age of about seven on, you use six to seven to teach them their math tables and things, from about seven on, when they start, if you're interested in Saxon math, if they start Saxon 5-4 at seven, uh, their mind knows that they are going to find a solution to that set of math problems every day. Nobody's going to help them. And there's enough in the book to teach them, and it works. Child works his way through. It seems strange, people working other ways, they don't think that could happen. And of course, if you set a kid that's a normal student down and start that, it might take two, two months to start while he complains and fidgets and fools and says, I don't know how to do it, and so forth. But eventually he can. And that way, he learns problem solving. And that's very important in learning to think. It's very important into approaching everything. You know, we have a world today in which uh, our, you know, we, we bemoan the fact that our values, uh, the values in the Bible, the values of right and wrong, simple things that people are supposed to know, certainly, they don't seem to know anymore. Uh, I, uh, we were trying to help a veterinarian uh, that we know recently, and this veterinarian said, well, I used to think things were black and white, but then I learned some psychology. I know that they're not. They're sort of gray. Well, it's horrible, you know, horrible, but the whole world, is, the society has become kind of gray. Well, the child that gets up in the morning and works math problems for two hours doesn't see it as a gray. He sees it as black and white. Things are right and wrong. It even has a very important value in teaching, his, in, in developing his moral character, because he sees things Things are true or false, and in math they are. Uh, we kind of boiled down. Uh, the other thing I, uh, another thing that I think is important in designing a curriculum is that it not contain things that it doesn't have to have. Uh, lots of mothers who uh, want the best for their child try to do everything at once. I used to, mothers will have 14 subjects, and every time they hear about another subject, oh, I don't want my child to be deprived of that, so they add that. Pretty soon the child is spending 10 minutes a day on each thing can't really learn much about anything because there's so many things and the mother's pulling her hair out trying to develop lessons on all these things. Most things don't need to be that, that you don't, most of the things that they're adding aren't necessary. We tried to t teach uh, in, uh, in our home school just reading, writing, and arithmetic, basically math followed by writing followed by reading. And in the reading, you get history and English and all the other things by, on the basis of book selection. Now, going to the homeschool movement, 
where uh, now I've, estimates are one and a half to two million children being homeschooled, which is wonderful. The, with the sociological driving force and a non-academic driving force and an industry that built up to supply homeschool materials, that industry built up to supply them at the level of quality that you see in the public schools. So mother says, I'm taking my fifth grader out of the public schools. I can't stand it anymore. Send me a fifth grade curriculum. And the industry sends her a fifth grade curriculum at the academic quality of a public school fifth grade curriculum. Well, already she's in trouble, you see, because the academic decay is still built into this. And you see that in a lot of our homeschool curriculums. They are very nice because they have taken out the things people don't want their children to learn. They often have added some Christian values and Christian thinking to them, which is what the majority of the homeschool movement would like to have added to them. Uh, but the academic quality, academic level, is still sitting at the level of our public schools instead of going back to what the child's capable of. Every child is capable of learning at the level that was done in the 60s, which is about two grade levels above what we have today. And probably at least half of our children are capable of learning at the great academic levels of the 30s, which is another two grade levels above what we have today. Uh, the important thing is that no single child be, be damaged by what the others are able to learn. If you can make the knowledge a, a continuous road that stretches out in front of the child, gets steeper as he gets more knowledgeable and has more ability, then he goes down that road at whatever rate his perseverance, perseverance and knowledge and capability and how hard he works permits. If he's not too fast a learner, he goes down slower, even if he works hard. If he's a very quick learner, he'll go down fast. The fast students won't be held back by the slow students, and the slow students are not feeling bad about themselves because they don't go as fast as the fast students. There aren't any signposts that says, you must do this. See, when you have a, a thing that says, this is a fifth grade curriculum, then you want to make everybody happy because you want to sell curriculums, you make sure that every student can do that. Well, that means that the good students are being deprived. Uh, because they can do it all right, but they could have done twice as much. Uh, moreover, just because a student moves slowly down that road doesn't mean that he will, in the end, not be a better student and better intellectually than the student that moves fast. The fast students often have a disadvantage. I have a an, uh, professor, there was a professor of mine, he's still a close friend of mine named Martin Kamen, who's 84 years old now. And I was reading his autobiography. He's famous. He discovered carbon-14 and so forth. I was reading his autobiography. He was a certified genius. This guy played with the Phil Philharmonic Orchestra in, orchestra in, in Chicago when he was a teenager and has a, a, basically a photographic memory. It reads like lightning. And, and uh, uh, he writes that he had a very hard time when he got into science because he read too fast. And he read so fast, it, it, reading fast didn't work because you had to analyze what you were reading and think about it and absorb facts in a different way than reading literature. And he had a very hard time slowing himself down so he could do it right. I've seen students who were very poor at math, or seemed to be, that move very slowly and so forth, guys that I knew in college and so forth. Often they are much better than the fast students because although they plod along, they remember what they learned, they learned to think with it and so forth. So you can't say, because a student moves slowly through math, he may move slowly through math and be one of the finest uh, scientists or mathematicians that his generation produces. The rate doesn't tell you anything at that age. But it is important that when he moves down the road, he not skip things, not, firstly, not be, uh, have all of his self-esteem taken away because he didn't have trouble with fifth grade math, and yet he's got to uh, learn it uh, learn it thoroughly as he goes, but if you put the knowledge out in front with no grades, no signposts, but it just gets harder as they go down, whether it's math or science or literature or history, whatever it is, it just gets harder as it goes along, then each student can go as far as he can. And uh, we try to make sure that every student has enough stuff laying out there that nobody can get through, even the fastest student can't get finished, so there's something out there he can't do. And that way, uh, there's always a challenge. The uh, uh, but it, it's, it's not a good thing that most of the homeschool curriculums are uh, academically at about the public school levels. But they're there because of the matching of grade levels, this kind of stuff. In Saxon Math, 5-4 is the first book that Saxon wrote. It was the introductory math book. Now it is labeled Saxon 5-4, meaning it's for fourth and fifth graders. 
and they filled in a Saxon one, two, and three before it. And what this really means is that the public schools don't get it to it until you're in the fourth and fifth grade, and they want everything to match, so they had to give them busy work for the first three years, something just to spin your wheels with and get nothing done until you got to be the fourth or fifth grade, and then you get on the track with everybody else. That book is very easy for any seven-year-old to do, and, uh, and it just works that way, and, and, and it should be. The literature and history, uh, you can... You can, uh, with a good library or good uh, efforts to use bookstores and so forth, find an lot, awful lot of good literature and history books. Uh, there's a, a, an oddity in the, uh, develop, in the materials that are used for homeschooling in this regard because there is a, a, a desire for companies to have proprietary products. In other words, they want to produce, have a book, and they own the book, and they sell the book, you know how it works, they're in business. So just like a Saxon math book. So they have a history book. Now this history book has to belong to them because it, they want to be the only publisher and sell it as part of their curriculum. So the book must be written in the contemporary times by someone whom they've hired or whatever. Or they at least buy the rights to the book or whatever. Anyway, they have this history book. Usually some contemporary history major is telling you about what happened in history. That may be a good book. Uh, but if you look out at the great libraries of Western civilization, there are at least 500 years of writing out there, and you can pick the best people that have ever written about history. You don't need a guy who just got out of college writing you a history book. Uh, if you're studying the Civil War, why not read the autobiographies of Grant and Sherman and the vice president and presidents of the Confederacy and the writings of Lincoln? These guys were there. They were doing it, and they write beautifully. It isn't necessary to read what some guy just got out of college wants to tell you happened in the Civil War. You can read, the people, read about it from the people who fought it. Uh, if you uh, uh, want to learn about British history or British literature, you can read Kipling. Kipling is fantastic, unbelievable. There are only a few men that good. But we have this great heritage. You can, and interestingly, as the... Uh, uh, rot in our schools has developed, the humanities have gone down the worst. Uh, the sciences have been kept. If you go to a university today, and every one of them I see, I, I work with scientists in different universities, and now my kids are going to university and so forth, and I used to teach there, so I kind of compare. It's almost the same in all of them. If you go in the chemistry departments, the physics departments, the mathematics departments, you find sane people. Uh, if you're interested in values, it's not uncommon to find all in the chemistry department that half the chair professors are Christians. The rest are at least decent people you'd be happy to have in your living room or at your dinner table. If you move out of those areas, it's awful. The, in history, English, these areas, the humanities. Uh, recently, I saw a piece, a man was fired as uh, a professor of literature in a university. His transgression was it included a play by William Shakespeare in his curriculum. Uh, they, uh, and the chairman of his department said that it was her goal to ban all classics from the literature curriculum. But if you read what they were reading, well, Noah had to take one course in the university, and Noah read it. He looked at the books, the trash he was being required to read, and about the only intellectual thing he did was to do a word frequency thing. He was curious about how often the four-letter words were in the books. Was it one in 20? What was the frequency? It was incredible, like every 20th word. Uh, you'd never recognize the authors they're teaching literature from in the universities today because they're not worth recognizing. And most of them are very recent people, and they're just competing with each other to see how much more their trashy their books can be from the next. Yet laying out there are hundreds of years of fantastic literature that's never mentioned, never in the curriculums anymore. Uh, but you don't have to have that in a home school. You can reach out and take all that, pick and choose from it, and, and choose, its, choose the best. In fact, uh, what we have in the homeschool movement, a very powerful movement with these one to two million children and dedicated parents, we really have, there's a split in American society. The families that are doing this are a, almost a subsection within our society as compared to the others where the kids are so unfortunate that they go to public schools. And this split and what is being put in the minds of the children, of the way they think, their values and so forth, 
Now we have pretty good control over them up to the age of 18, but then we have the universities, which are another hurdle. This is gradually disappearing, and I think uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the problem is gradually disappearing because of electronics. In the, in, the, uh, uh, in the computer revolution, which now puts a computer on uh, basically a miracle in a box on anyone's kitchen table, plus the internet that's enabling us to hook everybody together, what's gradually happening is that the institutions are losing their monopoly on knowledge. The university had a monopoly of knowledge. You had to go there to get knowledge. They had the, in the libraries and in their professors and so forth, they held this monopoly. And if you wanted an education of a certain level, you had to go there. Below that, in the age uh, 6 to 18, there's a sort of monopoly. They held the knowledge and you went there. But these monopolies are falling because now, I mean, pretty soon, they haven't scanned all the books yet, but technologically you could pick up the Library of Congress and walk out of the room with it in a little a little suitcase in CD-ROM form. So these monopolies on knowledge are falling. Also, the monopolies on teachers are falling. If you go to a university, you want to learn a course in physics. Well, there's a physics professor. He may be good and he may be bad. He may be a, more than likely, he's not too good because he was stuck teaching the course on physics, whereas the better guys are doing their research and managed to get out of it. But uh, every university may have 10,000 teachers of physics across the country, but you only need one. You only need the best one. The most outstanding teacher of physics today, or the best one we can get on record, and then you send him down the internet, or you put him on a CD-ROM, and there's no need for any other teachers of physics. You may need three. One teaching at the high level, one intermediate level, and one at a lower level, depending on the abilities of the students. But you don't need more than three professors of physics for the whole country. And with the electronics revolution, that's becoming a reality. Pretty soon, I think these institutions, with the decay they have, will just cease to exist because they, uh, their monopoly on knowledge is gone, and moreover, the quality will be higher in electronic form. Today, in the home schools, you can reach back several centuries and pick the literature and things from the past that was the best and weed out the stuff you don't like and expose that to your students. And then you have only one other thing, once you've found the material for them, is to teach them good study habits and a good study environment. That's just a matter of discipline in the home. People sometimes say, well, I can't teach, I can't get my child to sit and do his math. Well, they don't have an academic problem, they have another problem. They, you, know, you should be able to say, you sit there until you do your math. If it takes him 12 hours, it took him 12 hours, but he should sit there because he's obedient and does what his parents say. But once the child has a, if I, into describing a study environment, I think it's important a study environment have no distractions. So uh, I make sure that the kids clean their desk closets, so nothing on them when they leave. When they come in the morning, they've got this great big desk and nothing on it to distract them. And I don't put a, stuff, a lot of stuff on the walls to make it look like a schoolroom because the action's on the desk, not on the walls. I don't want something for them to stare at. And then they get out their book, and there's a book, them, the desk, and that's all there is. That's the whole world. And then they sit there for their five hours, six days a week, and they do their work. First their math, then their writing, then their reading, in history and English and the other things they're to read, and then go about their day. And if a child does that every day, and during his best hours in the early part of the day, five hours a day, six days a week, year after year, he learns how to study and how to learn. And uh, the only uh, parental, the really things, the most important things the parents have to do is to teach him that that's what he must do. I get a little frustrated when people say, oh, my child's a squirmer, you know, my child doesn't, you know, doesn't like this sort of thing. Well, what they're doing is a disservice to the child. The child doesn't know what he wants. When I went to Caltech as a uh, freshman, I wanted to be a scientist. Everybody in my entering, and I think 95% of my entering class said they wanted to be nuclear physicists, including me. That was because that was the most complicated thing we could pronounce. We didn't have the slightest idea what nuclear physics was. We were high school students. Um, so they, had a, they did a service to us. They gave us a good course in math, and one in physics, and one in chemistry, and they taught us pretty fast whether we wanted to be nuclear physicists. Some of us learned that we could make A's in chemistry and not in physics. You get the idea. You, it was their obligation. It was our obligation to show up and do the work. It was their obligation to tell us what we needed to learn. In a home school, it's the same way. The child shows up, but it's your obligation to tell them what they must do. They don't know. They don't know anything about it. So. If you don't instill discipline and make them do it, then you're hurting them, and they don't know it. 
not helping them to go with their idiosyncrasies. But uh, the, uh, to summarize, uh, I think that anybody can run a home school. It's good for a child, parent to be around as an example, to be nearby, to kind of watch them. And if they start to fidget too much, to say once, stop fidgeting. Only once. It shouldn't be necessary to do more than that in a well-disciplined home. And uh, see that they, they uh, do, do their work. Then you have an enormous literature from which to draw the materials to teach them. If you want help with that, there are many curriculums that draw these things together to, for you to help you pick from. And we've tried to do that in our curriculum, too. Uh, and, if you exp and it isn't necessary to spend much time with the child. In fact, you're really not helping him when you're spending time with them. I described about the math problems, but it's true of everything. The knowledge is in the book. The job is to get the knowledge from the book to the child and to do it in an environment and under circumstances where he thinks about what he's learning. And if anything else that gets in the way is just in, diminishes the process, including a teacher. You get in the way, and that makes it harder for him to learn, or he comes to depend on you, and so on and so on. I'll tell one anecdote about this, which is uh, protect, perhaps uh, indicative. When uh, Loralee died, there were um, my twins, Joshua and Bethany, were six. And girls often start a year earlier than boys, so Bethany was on, started pretty well, and Joshua was just starting school. So there was a nice lady who was a friend of ours who thought she would help the Robinson family, so she kind of took Joshua under her wing, and she'd come and teach him. And uh, Joshua got to learn that, uh, began, I didn't realize what was going on, or I didn't even understand what I do today about homeschooling, but Joshua learned that school was a nice lady sitting behind, beside you, uh, doing things with you and everything and so forth. After a few months and I was getting under control what the others were learning, I came up for air and started looking at what Joshua was learning. Well, I said, he's work we're working on his math tables. How he's doing? How's he doing? Well, we're through addition. And I said, well, what about the rest? Well, that'll be, you know, next year. And I began to realize what the problem was, so I took him away from the nice lady and I put him at a desk with the others. Well, he hated it. I said, Joshua, you will sit there and do your work. And he just stared and fidgeted, which is what almost any child who hadn't been in that environment would do. Joshua was at the desk about 12 hours a day. And I would say, look over at him and say, well, uh, it's your day. It seems crazy to waste it. You know, you can, you know, you can do the job. And uh, well, he's just sitting there, rebelling in every way, you know. All the daydreams and probably not so nice thoughts of his father that went through his head in those months. But he had to sit there. And it was no, in our family, especially with no mother there, you can imagine the discipline is a little, maybe, I, I'm not saying I beat the children. I'm just saying you don't cross your father very fast. Uh, he knew he had to sit there. And uh, so he sat day after day, week after week. Took Joshua two or three months before he buckled down of sitting. He'd sit until he got it done, or he'd sit until the day was over. At the end, he just rolls along like anybody else. He doesn't remember the incident. Can't remember it. But uh, now he has the same study habits as everybody else. He just started the wrong way. It reminds me of a story of my youth that I've been told about. I don't remember it either, but my mother was a second grade teacher over in Iowa. And uh, I guess I came home from the first grade and I read my little book and just fine. I read everything just fine, you know, and uh, it looked like I was learning. Then she gave me a book that I hadn't seen before and I couldn't read anything. I was memorizing the book. And so I guess it was very painful at my house for a while while she <laughs> forced me to learn to read. But uh, uh, it would have been horrible if she had been nice to me. Uh, instead, she was tough with me. So this, this doesn't come naturally to sit there. But now, it, it isn't, I, I think, uh, after the children start to do it, they appreciate it. And they enjoy it. Uh, sometimes I'm sitting at my desk working and I think of something I think they'd like to know and I'll sort of stop the school and I'll look over and I'll start giving this little talk and teaching them this thing. And they, they're listening all right, but it's very obvious from the expressions that they wish he'd get done so they could go back to work. <laughs> the job is to sit there, do your work. So once you get a person into that mindset, it's, it does it. And I've seen the results, too, in college. When I went to Caltech, there were many students who were very good because you had to be good academically to go. But the guys that had study habits were the ones that excelled at extraordinary study habits. No, no reason those can't be instilled when you're a little kid. Well, I've kind of talked around different aspects of this, but maybe we could talk about things that interest you. If somebody has a question or a comment. Huh? 
Yeah, well, th this is a problem in all home schools. The problem is that uh, the child's uh, knowledge sinks to sometimes to the level of the prejudices of the parent. And I've never liked spelling. So as a consequence, I didn't teach spelling, <laughs> okay. Now, uh, I've said, and the way we do it, we say, well, if you read enough good literature and outstanding material by outstanding writers, you will learn vocabulary, grammar, syntax, spelling, and everything sort of by osmosis. You see enough of it, you always see the word spelled right, so you'll learn it. Uh, and spelling is kind of arbitrary. Have you ever read anything written by George Washington or some of his competitors? The spelling is incredible. They spell the same word three or four ways. This was not standardized then. Of course, spelling is an arbitrary thing. This works with most kids, at least my experience is it worked with most of mine, but not all. I have one in which it didn't work very well. Uh, it is, I think, a good way to learn grammar and spelling and uh, vocabulary and so forth by just exposure to vast amounts of good material. I think that, I, I have done no statistics, but my guess would be 80% of children will pick it up fine that way, but some won't. And so it's important to have something for those that don't. Now, in vocabulary, for example, we put into our curriculum a, a very rigorous vocabulary exerciser for 6,000 words that are key to the books they learn to force them to learn the vocabulary if they're not learning it anyway. In grammar, it's good to have a good grammar text available. If the child is not picking up good grammar, then you give him some grammar lessons. Now, this does not mean that he has grammar year after year for six years. It's, the grammar isn't that complicated but he may need some grammar lessons. Similarly, if his spelling, I see when you correct, the only thing a parent in the way that we teach does every day is to grade their essay. They write a, write a page every day and you circle the errors. If they spell something wrong, you circle it. Don't fix it for them, you circle it. They have to go figure out how it's spelled. But uh, if by this feedback every day of not, of, of uh, having their, exam their papers graded, they still don't start spelling right, well then you may need to do some spelling lessons. I don't think it's necessary to force it on the child unless he doesn't learn the other way. Uh, if you, and you look at the, even the uh, standard tests, the classic aptitude tests for college entrance have a lot of grammar on them. But the grammar is of this sort. Here's a sentence, here's a piece that's missing, here are five pieces, which piece fits? And anyone who works that exam by what sounds right has a great advantage over anybody who tries to dissect the grammar. Um, a student that tries to dissect the grammar and figure out from grammar what goes in there doesn't have a chance because he can't do it fast enough. It has to sound right. So it's the better way to learn. You don't have these rules in the way. You, you, of course, I'm sure I've made many gram grammatical errors here in the last half hour, but you don't have those rules in the way. So it's better to learn that way. The grammar really comes in, well, it doesn't sound right. What's wrong with it? Then you can dissect it and tell him. And if he knows grammar, he can understand what you said. But really, the error was made before any of you thought about any grammar. But it, it, I think it's, the bottom line is most people can learn without it. But if they don't, they should have the standard text, the standard courses. Were you going to say? Is he asked if there was any value to Latin and Greek? I think there is. Uh, I had to take two years of Latin, I remember, in school. I can't remember any of it today. I remember a little bit. I remember the teacher used to go around during the exam saying, Tempus fugit, time is flying. That's all the Latin I think I know. But uh, the problem is, I wouldn't put it in a homeschool curriculum. The reason I wouldn't is because there's only so much time, and I'd be worried about what I was subtracting. That's, but this is, a, this is a question of judgment. Some people will say, if you learn Latin, that's the basis of other languages, and it's the basis of your language. I'm familiar with all the arguments. That's why I had to take Latin, because you couldn't go to the, I wanted to go to Rice University at the time before I learned about Caltech. You can go unless you took two years of Latin. And the scholars of the day believed this was very good for your development, and I think it probably is. Uh, it's a matter of choice. You have only so much time. What are you going, how are you going to have the student spend his time? My prejudice is that languages can be done later and that, that Latin, though it's nice, is not worth the time it takes, but that's my prejudice. It may not be the best way. It's almost impossible to find Latin anywhere in the United States. Oh, yes. You go to a great university. Like you went to high school in the 60s. Yeah. Sure. 
You can't find it in a university. You go to a university today, with 20, a big state university with 20,000 students, and you won't find any Latin or Greek or anything. I've got a student uh, with me the last couple of weeks from Germany, and they had Latin. Had Latin, yeah. That's right. It's a very, it's, it is, I think, a very valuable thing to study. I would not put it in a curriculum because of just, it's my judgment that it's not as valuable as some of the other things, but I won't say that that's true. I'll say it's my estimate that it's true. And it's this tragedy that it's not in the schools. Uh, if they're going to do all kinds of subjects, imagine the things they've got in the schools instead of the Latin or the other things. But this is, we, they're dropping not only the Latin and things like that, they're dropping, I mean, dropping virtually all great literature. All the great literature of the English language is being dropped. And this is hard to believe, but it's true. They're dropping all of it. And uh, even in English, let alone the Latin. So the Latin is probably left over from the days in which no scholar, I mean, all scholarship was in Latin, right? If you go back a couple of, a few more generations, that all the scholars in Europe, well, like even scientists, Isaac Newton did his great physics book. It was in Latin. <laughs> Wouldn't have thought of writing it in English, I guess. Yeah. Um, my question goes back to when you started talking about that. Mm -hmm. Well, you could go to college because the majority of the kids in the college don't know math over sixth grade either. But that, that's, uh, you, it's not that you couldn't. You were just done a different way. Regardless of what your math skills were, there's no doubt you could sit there with the book and figure it out. Just nobody told you to do that. Problem, and in an earlier time, the approach of well, let's just get some good books and teach myself was very sensible because people were judged on the basis of what they could do and accomplish and knew. I'm sure Daniel Boone didn't have a degree from any university, but um, the this is a problem that uh, especially homeschool parents face because a child, okay, they control their environment up to 18. Now, what are they going to do? put them in this, this college. The problem is that if you don't, if you go to college and you realize, well, yes, I could learn this on my own and maybe learn it better, but you won't have that piece of paper they're generating. If you don't, if you have responsibility for a, a son or daughter and you say, well, I can see a way through life for you that is a better way that doesn't require the piece of paper. At the same time, if you let them not, gener not get that piece of paper, then many doors close, and you can't predict what their life will be. In the, in, the, in the advice I give my kids with respect to what they should do as professions or what they should do in life or what would be best for them, there's no need for a piece of paper. But I won't let the ones that are better get out of school until they have a PhD, because they need the piece of paper to keep the doors open that they may need to open in life. So the, the college becomes a quest for a piece of paper. It's not right, but that's the way it is. We're our first daughter. Now my, my uh, oldest daughter's 18. She has to start college. This is awful. I mean, it's one thing to have your, your son go and have to take some of this nonsense. You're going to send a daughter to this. And uh, I'm doing my best to work it out so that she'll be able to go and take the least of the nonsense possible. But she's got to have the piece of paper, even though uh, her life, as she probably envisions it, and as I would think it would be idealized, will never require that piece of paper. 
I know that life has many vicissitudes, and it may be that she will need to open one, a door in life that requires a college degree. See the, what I mean? So the, yeah. eventually we'll just get homeschool college and can get rid of it, but we don't have that yet. And it may come though electronically, I think it will come. But not yet. That's a problem. Hmm. Yeah. See, I just finished uh, enrolling this daughter and I went over and arranged it. It's not that I'm trying to make scientists out of the kids, it's the only thing they've got there that we can be sure is is you can put into a human mind. So I said, well, she'll take chemistry, physics, and math the first year. Uh, then we won't, I won't have to worry the first year. I'm a fourth the way through, and we haven't got any, any of the rot. And I, uh, I was fortunate. Uh, Noah's advisor turned out to be the guy I was supposed to consult about this. And I went and just level with him. He's chairman of the chemistry department. I said, I wanted to take chemistry, physics, and math. And she's not going to take a lot of the humanities courses in this place because she's just, I mean, my daughter, no daughter of mine is ever going to sit in those, in those rooms. And he understood completely. We worked out a nice thing, filled up all the units with the math, physics, and chemistry. Then I went down to the registrar and got her almost registered. And the registrar came up for air and she says, wait, she doesn't have her colloquium. That's the humanities department. She, she has to be taught her critical thinking skills. No one is allowed to enter as a freshman without the critical thinking skill course. And, uh, and uh, she was just determined that no freshman was going to get into that college that wasn't in this mess. You can imagine what critical thinking school skills they're talking about. And so uh, uh, I said, well, maybe my daughter can't attend your college. And, so, not, unfailing to convince me, she took me though, across the hall to the Dean of Admissions. He was going to teach me. And I lucked out. When the dust settled, the Dean let us out and let me out of it. And she got to take only the science. Science uh, is a good thing to study. It's not necessarily become a scientist. If you have to go to university, it's a good place to, to way to avoid a lot of the, uh, the other nonsense. But it's hard to avoid it all. No, I had to take a criminology course to get out of taking a psychology course. So you just find your way through this maze and you can't find your way through all of it. Zachary graduated from Oregon State. We sent him there because it was supposed to be the most conservative of the universities in Oregon. He wanted to be close to home. There was one course required of every student, a health course. And the health course, uh, uh, his 45-year-old man, advisor in chemistry, was too embarrassed to discuss the contents with him. So I went over to the uh, bookstore and I got the book. And I looked at the book. The book was fine. Was brush your teeth, eat right, you know, it's little things that you should know, but at least, you know, keep you just some normal hygiene. And, I, and, and Zachary enrolls in the course. And the first half of the course is taught by a man right out of the book. It's fantastic. Brush your teeth, wash your face, you know, very simple stuff. And then after they got through halfway through the course, they brought in a woman with a hyphenated last name. And from then on, uh, part of the students just walked out of every lecture. They couldn't stand it. Unbelievable. So bad he won't even tell me what he was, was in the course. Yeah. After your curriculum's been out there for a couple of years now, yeah. uh, what kind of responses are you hearing from the people that are using it? Because obviously your children had a, had a tremendous team pulled up to... Uh, well, that's not necessarily so. He says that my kids had a better gene pool. I, I don't really think that's true. 
they, for academic things, they're probably they're above average in raw ability in some things. But I've never met anybody in my life who wasn't better than me at some things and that I wasn't better at some things. Every human being you meet has got abilities far beyond yours in some things, and you've got abilities far beyond his. It's rare. It's not total. I used to work on, uh, in my research on mental illness, and about 1% of the children who are born have severe mental difficulties. It's genetic. Beyond that, I don't think you need to spend so much time on the gene pool. But in any case, the answer to your question has been out, the, the, the main curriculum has been out about a year and a half. And of course, most people buy something, you go away, you never see them again. So you, your feedback is from a, a subset of those. The feedback's very good in three ways. One, an awful lot of the curriculums we sell now are by word of mouth, so there are a lot of people who like it enough to convince somebody else to do it. Um, the people who call us with questions, most of them are very positive and upbeat, and I receive a lot of nice letters from people, a lot, not percentage-wise in the total, but the letters I receive are mostly very nice. The other indication is that people use it, and about one in 200 will call up very dissatisfied with it. So we have a, that's a fraction that don't like it. I mean, don't like it enough to tell me. Um, so, and I know, of course, some that are using it, and I know their, specific, their experiences in detail, and they, they seem to like it very well. So a mixture of the way people recommend it to others and these things, uh, it, you see it just consists of a teaching method and books. And our selection of books is certainly not the best that could be selected, it's just the best we could do. And uh, the teaching method seems to work for people, so they like it. I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah. So your I don't, uh, the, the thing that, uh, um, most of the questions that parents ask are very simple questions and it's not a difficulty. It's just something that they, they know the answer but they want to know that you said it's the same answer or something. The thing that is most often mentioned, and this isn't too often, but it's, it's mentioned by that one in 200, let's say, those people, they uh, most commonly say, well, my child couldn't do this. I'll never get him to do this. It's almost, it's almost always by people who never tried. But they will say, my child couldn't do this. Um, we need uh, dancing pictures on the screen and manipulatives and so forth. It isn't their idea of education. That, that's fairly common, though. It's a very common thing to say that I couldn't get my child to do this. Uh, uh, how, it's, it's basically the discipline question. I don't hear that so much from people who are trying it as people who don't try it because they think they couldn't get their child to sit and study. That's the most common comment. It's not too common, but it's the main comment made by the, the small fraction that basically reject it. They don't try it, but they read it and say, gee, I'm sitting at a desk four hours, five hours a day, this is impossible. <laughs> yeah. That's the question I had really was what they repeat was on the one two hundred one. That's the main thing they say. We occasionally I've had two that reject what? Yeah, it doesn't bother me. The, the, uh, uh, there have been two that have rejected it, two out of, uh, out of a very large number uh, who have rejected it because it's got too much Christianity in it. It doesn't teach the Christian faith, but it has some overtly Christian books, and it's completely compatible with the home that's teaching the Christian faith. I said in the beginning that I wasn't going to try to teach Christianity to anyone because it's not my specialty, and besides, I believe that we had some unique ideas that were of value to share with people about how to run their home school. But I don't believe that I have any reason to say that the way I've taught the faith in my family is superior to what others would do. So I'm not out trying to clone it because it seems to work in our family, but there are many ways, and I'm no expert on it, so I would be out of line saying this is the way you should teach the faith to your family. So that curriculum is designed to be compatible with any teaching of the Christian faith, but it has a little bit of Christianity in it. They don't like that. The, uh, I've only had two rejected from that reason, but they're, we've, they're memorable. <laughs> um, the, uh, you asked something else, and I got off on that. Oh, yes. This is not a problem. In fact, it's kind of interesting. I don't know how long we'll be able to sell this curriculum. We've been surprised at what it's done. But uh, we're kind of in a funny niche. Uh, the animation is not 
and it's not just not competition. That's not learning. But the funny niche, which I alluded to earlier, is the books. Uh, last year, the Practical Homeschooling has a little poll, this magazine, Practical Homeschooling, and they rated us third in the country in high school in popularity as a high school curriculum. The first two were Bob Jones and Becca. We were third. And that's pretty good in a year and a half, given that we're just a family on a farm and these guys are, are corporations. But uh, they can't really compete with us because they're caught. They need proprietary books. They, are, they have to sell something that's fairly expensive to support their organization. And so they're coming at, if you want to look at it in competition, they're coming at us with this very well worked out set of proprietary books. And we're coming back at them with the best that we can select from 500 years of, of English libraries. And they can't compete with that. There's no, they, they can't hire Kipling. They can't hire Shakespeare. They can't hire Mark Twain. And yet, they can't use them as extensively because they're not proprietary. So it's a funny competitive environment. The animation doesn't bother me. And you would say, you could say on its face, all right, you got some great books. Anybody can get these great books. The teaching method is a little unique, but that doesn't take much to communicate. The oddity is that the competition is having a hard time using the great books because you can't sell them for very much. And I think, like this curriculum now is $195 for 12 years. I predict that in a few years it's going to be $20, and the, I mean, the price competition is just going to drive the cost of driving the cost of information to zero. Information basically has become free because of the of the electronics. What's not free still is selecting which information. The selection is uh, you can open your get on your internet or just get you can the, just the amount of information that can flow into you now is enormous, but you still. Uh, there's still a, uh, an economic need for filters because somebody's got to filter and decide, help you decide what you want to look at because no human being can make a decision for himself. But it's an odd niche because so far nobody's trying to compete with us on the, on the books. And yet the quality, when we can pick the best guys out of all those hundreds of years and they have to take what they can hire, they don't have a chance. So uh, we have this niche. I don't know how long it'll last. It's not affected by the dancing figurines on the screen. That's just, uh, well, I would say yeah. It's a serious curriculum. Yeah. All these other things are kind of gimmicky, and they look good. Yeah. Even if they're done by good, done by good people, we have as our physics book. We use a physics book that was a freshman text at Caltech. It was written by three Caltech professors, and one of them I happened to take math from when I was a student. And I convinced them to let us have the book, to let us put it on the thing. And I was taught this professor's name was Apostle, and I was talking to him one day, and he was asking me about the videotapes. I said, what videotapes? He said, well, didn't you know we did a whole set of videotapes that goes with that book? I thought that's why you wanted to use the book. I said, well, I didn't know you had any videotapes. Didn't you read the introduction? I said, no, I didn't read the introduction. I looked at the, <laughs> the book, not the introduction. Turned out that Caltech had gotten millions of dollars and had done tremendous animated videotapes on the physical principles, the physics, that went with this book. So, and they were expensive. Uh, they spun them off to something that's supposed to be nonprofit and good for kids, and you could buy a set of these videotapes for $300. Well, that's steep. But anyway, I thought, well, gee, we ought to buy a set and look at them. So we spent the $300, got the videotapes, and I started showing them to my kids, and their eyes just glazed over. They're beautifully done. And they had the men that devised them were they're the brilliant men, very famous physicists, mathematicians. They put a lot of thought into it. You see this, like the Pythagorean theorem, you see this thing unfold in just sheer beauty, the way they've done this. But it's just a video show. It's kind of a passive TV screen. And the child that works problems and really studies the math and the physics looks at it and just says, so what? Even when you do that stuff very well is what I'm saying. The dancing figures, the colors, you know, the sliding planes, all this stuff. And those, the quality of people who did that will not get any better. The budget will not get any more unlimited. And yet those videotapes are completely non-essential to that book. And I could never, I don't think I ever got one of my kids to watch the whole set. It's just not a way to teach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, you've got the vocabulary. Yeah. Are they doing the vocabulary on the screen? They're drawing it in written writing? Printed out all the flashcards? One other thing you might try. Uh, firstly, on that vocabulary, it's hard vocabulary. I'll tell you how I devised it. The, a lady that worked on the exams went through the books picking out what seemed to be the hardest words. Those became key to the books. But then I took about 30 or 40 past scholastic aptitude tests, and I made sure that every word that was a vocabulary word required for those tests appeared in the word list, too. And those that were unique and not in the books, we stuck in the vocabulary anyway. So if you uh, know all those words, the SA, and the SAT verbal is largely a vocabulary test, so fantastic preparation for that. But they're tough words. There's one learning technique that's in there. Uh, a guy sent me a book about it. He sent me this little thing. What's that called? The What's this book called? A little tiny paperback. and we, It's hard to find now. But anyway, this fellow went to college in the humanities, and he flunked out. So he went to college again, and he flunked out again. He went to college a third time, and this time he took his lecture notes, and he went home from every day, and he lectured to an empty room, re-giving the professor's lecture from his notes. In other words, he lectured to an empty room from his own notes. He taught the course to the chest of drawers in his room. He did that with every course, and he made straight A's. And uh, I've, I've sort of dubbed it oral learning. And there's a little section on there about that. The section goes by very quick. Your eyes may glaze over. Well, that's fine. That's for that's something I can get to. Uh, I have only gotten two of my kids to do this. Bethany's doing it now. Dad, Noah doesn't know that. But I got Noah to do it. And Noah was, he got through the first physics book. He gets in the second physics book. It's electricity and magnetism. It's tough. He was spent time, like maybe four hours a day on his physics and missing a third of the problems. And uh, so why don't you try this oral learning? So Noah started, he, he started doing it. He, he basically he goes to a room where there's no one can hear him and bites off a little bit of the book. It may be a paragraph, part of a paragraph, whatever. He bites off a little of it and then uh, lectures to the room about that. As much as he can hold in his head, he teaches. Then he bites off the next piece and teaches and so on. Does that with the whole physics book. He was getting done in half the time and missing nothing because of the oral learning. Yeah, let me finish. I'll tell my story and then I'll go to that. Uh, I told Apostle about this and he says, well, I'm not surprised it works. I'm just surprised you could get him to do it. Uh, it's something every professor knows. When you teach a course, you learn it very well. I used to notice that some of the more famous people would teach elementary courses. And people always said of them, oh, isn't it fine? This great scientist loves students so much. He teaches the first year course. You know, he's, it's his love of students. I always suspected it was something else that they would never admit. And that was if they taught introductory chemistry or physics or whatever it was, they learned it better themselves in every pass. And often people say, well, if you help other students, you will learn better. That's true, but you only, it's hit and miss. It's whatever they don't know. You just do a little of it. That is an incredible technique. He's been using it in college now, and it's being, it's just wonderful for him. If a student can learn, to, to, because you, you can learn by reading, you can learn by hearing, but it's an incredible amount of learning you can learn by teaching, by orally teaching. And if, in vocabulary, I'm sure it would work. I've got Bethany. I told her to start trying it on the vocabulary. She's doing it on her physics, but I said try it on the vocabulary. Uh, if they verbalize it, they go to a room where there is no one can hear them and use the words out loud. When you talk, when you verbalize something, it's a very, very valuable way of learning that people don't usually use. But giving a lecture on a subject, or in a case of a vocabulary, just a mini lecture where you use it in a couple of sentences, that oral learning technique is an unbelievably powerful tool for learning. It's just that few people will do it. His older brother, I never could get him over his self-consciousness, even though no one could hear you. He was too self-conscious to do it. 
Bethany was almost crying when I said, you have to go try it. But she did do it, because she's dutiful and did what I asked. It's helping her. It's a wonderful technique. And uh, there's just a little couple, par a couple of pages about it on there. But it really works. If you ask Noah about it, he can tell you. It's fantastic. And teachers know that. Like Apostle said, this guy has spent his life teaching top math students. And he's a top mathematician. He knew instantly. He says, of course it works. But how do you get the student to do it? If you can get your student to do something like that, there's another technique you might try. They've got to learn the vocabulary. And if they're getting tired of reading and saying and stuff like that, they might try verbalizing. Yeah, yes, you're next. He was way. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, firstly, it's gotten, because of the battles of a lot of homeschool and families, it's gotten so that there's really no jurisdiction in which you can't homeschool. This wasn't true 20 years ago. One of the reasons we live in Oregon is it was easy there. Uh, we had lots of relatives back in Iowa, and we kind of would have preferred to live there, but we didn't because Iowa was a hard place to homeschool. The authorities were nasty, and many homeschoolers suffered their kids, people tried to take their children, or they got into big litigation. Now that's pretty settled. The movement's too strong, too much of it, and there's no jurisdiction in which you can't homeschool. But each jurisdiction has different bureaucratic requirements. And I always, I'm sorry, I, I always just say to the parents, I'm sorry, we, we will provide you with what we think is best educationally. We provide nothing for your bureaucrat's filing cabinet. We don't know what he wants in it. And there are probably a thousand different sets of requirements. Each state has requirements, localities have requirements, and more importantly, the officials re enforce those requirements in differing ways. The, the family has to find out what the authorities are going to demand in their locality and then give it to them. And uh, this sometimes involves making it up. I mean, you don't have a formal history course, but they say, what is in your history course? So you kind of have to look at the books and say, well, they study the Civil War and the Revolutionary War and stuff like this. You have to make up. Many homeschoolers do what we did, uh, which is simply not let the authorities know that the kids were there. The but that's a problem. No, I know. I know in Oregon they were fairly lax. I mean, I look, you're a man on a farm, wife is dead, and the kids are between 12 and one and a half. What do you think the social workers are thinking of that? And obviously, some neighbors talk to the social workers, and I had a social worker call me up, but I'm lucky about where I lived, I guess. I talked to her a while. She said, How are the kids doing? I said, Fine. She didn't know that she would never have gotten on my farm, but there would have been a terrible fight. But it didn't come to that. She said, well, things are going fine. I see no reason to butt into your business. And she hung up. But that isn't the way it is in all states. I took my kids into New Jersey on a, on a uh, vacation once, and I almost lost them. We drove into New Jersey. There's a man we were just visiting just now. We just came from New York. He's probably my favorite scientist. He's a, 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 a man who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for synthesizing the first enzyme. But he's a really unusual fine human being besides he's old. He's in his 70s. And uh, we were going to New York. And I wanted the children to meet him. And I didn't know how long he would live. It turned out he's in good health. He's lived many years since. But they were about the age they were shortly after my wife died. We went into New York in a pickup truck with this two seats. No, two doors, but you got a seat in the back. So the whole seven of us are in this pickup truck, and of course the back is a shell on it. You'd imagine what that was like. We had everything stuffed in this shell. We drive into New York, and because we're going to Rockefeller University, we had on our best clothes that we had with us. I had a coat and tie, and the rest had on the best of whatever they were wearing. We go up to Rockefeller, but there was a cold going around the car. And Matthew, who was the youngest, four or five years old at that point, had the cold. And he was coughing. And we got up there, and we're in Merrifield's office. He noted, noticed Matthew coughing, and we were to go out and spend the weekend with them at their house in New Jersey, he and his wife. So Merrifield asked me if I would like a doctor to look at him. And uh, I said, sure. So their, parent, their children are grown, so she just makes an appointment with the medical clinic over in New Jersey. And we show up at 5.30. The normal doctors are gone, but two women doctors are on call. I'll try to shorten the story, but the bottom line is that uh, they look at Matthew just briefly after making us wait about half an hour, 
and come up with a diagnosis that he may have a rare bacterial disease which is so dangerous that you need intravenous antibiotics in the hospital immediately. There's no time to wait for cultures. Have to hospitalize him now. And I called my pediatrician in Oregon, and he said, well, I don't know what to say. I can't see him. The disease exists. It's quite rare. So I let him hospitalize him. The rest of the kids go to visit the Merrifields, and I'm in the hospital with Matthew. He's in the hospital, respirator, the whole thing like this. Um, and uh, ultimately, when we got the hospital record, it said hospitalized for a reason other than a medical emergency. We got to the hospital, and the doctor in the hospital examined him and said, I don't know why you're here, but I guess your doctor is very, you know, is very cautious. So I spent the night with my son with the IV drip and the respirator and the whole thing in his hospital. And mid-morning, the next morning, the reason we were there walked in. It was a tough social worker from New Jersey, demanded that I leave the room and talk with two men she had outside. And then I did probably the smartest thing in my life. I said I wouldn't leave the room. And they tried for about two hours to get me out, and then they agreed to interview me there. They had, uh, what had happened was that either a nurse or a doctor, somebody from the clinic had seen the five kids in the car outside and gone out and tried to talk to them. They tried to get them out of the car. The kids are told not to get out of the car and talk to strangers. Uh, they decided to turn me in for child abuse, and they developed this scheme to hospitalize one and grab, and grab us. It had nothing to do with his health. Uh, then they interviewed me. They uh, wanted to know how much money I had in my pocket, how much my home had cost, where I'd gotten the money to buy my home. Most of the interview was on finance. I think they were trying to find out if I was tough enough to fight. Because each kid was worth about $100,000 to the state. There's a federal program that gives a huge amount of support for each child that they can grab. And here you had six. So we were worth a half a million dollars to those people. Um, Ultimately, they finished on me. They went out to the Merrifields to interview the others. They took this guy, his Nobel Prize winner, out in the kitchen and grilled him for about an hour. And then finally they went away, still not releasing Matthew. And I asked Dr. Merrifield what the guy was talking to him in the kitchen about. He says, he kept saying, your kids are too quiet. And I said, children learn by example. But believe me, the main crime of the kids was they were too quiet. And uh, ultimately, uh, I made an agreement with them that I would attend all kinds of meetings with them and get involved in all kinds of stuff to worry about just what to do with my family and so on and so on and so on if they would just let Matthew out of the hospital, which they did, and we drove as fast as we could for the border. <laughs> and I probably would go back to New Jersey. But uh, that was uh, New Jersey. In Oregon, they left me alone. Fortunately, that's where I lived. Uh, you can always worry about these social workers. It's a terrible industry and it's driven by federal money. And one of the rules in that huge federal thing, which is supposed to be for child abuse, is that the state adopts certain laws and regulations. And one of the regulations they adopt is that it is a felony for any health care provider and others of certain professions not to report a child that may be abused. So. If you had two hospital, two MDs and two nurses in that clinic that night, and one of them got nervous about the, 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 the uh, truck, all of them would have to look at each other, wondering if one of them would turn them in if they didn't take action. So it's not necessarily that there were four people there that were in it, but the others would have to be tacitly in it if one mentioned it. It's a bad problem. And, I mean, I just, the guy was just in my office a week or so ago. He's a, a lawyer from Utah. And this Cuban family, the authorities went after their kids, and they escaped to Arizona. And the SWAT team surrounded them and got them there and grabbed their kids. And they're back in Utah trying to get their. The woman's crime is that she f refused to allow one of her sons to be given Ritalin. Ritalin. It's a drug. It's a tranquil. It's a drug they give kids in the public schools. It's awful. But uh, so you can run into this social net anywhere, and some of it is pretty bad. We didn't, and an awful lot of, at least in Oregon, an awful lot of the homeschoolers are off the books because the social workers leave us alone. Yeah. Say it again. No, I, the disease didn't exist a number of years ago, and I don't think it exists now. It certainly exists after they, it, after it's treated, it becomes a syndrome that exists. There are two forms, attention deficit disorder and hyperactive attention deficit disorder. 
and the treatment in the hyperactive one is such that a, percent, a fairly large percentage of those kids wind up in psychiatric hospitals. It's the treatment that's putting them there. Not, the disorder doesn't exist. Is that right? I don't know. Yeah. The other way. I, I don't know. This it's it's just criminal. It's child. This is just child abuse. The whole public school system is child abuse, though. There's just no other way to describe it. And the drugs are just part of it. Yes. I'm sorry. I'll, you, okay, you go ahead. Your, your experience in having them teach you the math one way and you couldn't learn it that way, you learn it another way. This is a, this is a bad problem. If you take, if you look at the, uh, the, my sons took advanced placement tests to get out of classes in college, and these tests are supposedly geared to what the students should know. In mathematics, in the calculus, in the, in the mathematics section, uh, a student who was so good he could work the problems by inspection, write the answers down without ever writing a note on a piece of paper, might not be able to pass the exam because part of the grade is on how you work the problem. And they've gotten more and more into a thing where they demand you work it their way, which is just absolute craziness. And of course, if a student, like she's talking about, if she could sit down and learn it from the book and work the problems, what's the difference? She might have a different way of doing it. The great mathematicians had different ways of looking at it. If they looked at it the same as everybody else, they wouldn't have been any, done anything unusual. You might have an unusual ability for math. You don't know that. You, Look at it your way, it might be better than my way. My, my other question would be what just experience of public school considers like a learning disability. Mm -hmm. um, that they define learning disability as um, you just can't learn, they can't have to learn anybody else, etc. So they put it in um, a class. Sure it can. If, if attention deficit disorder certainly can. If I had to sit in a public school room, I would have attention deficit disorder, I hope. Because <laughs> I, I surely wouldn't want to pay attention to what they were doing. And if you talk about so-called learning disabilities, say in mathematics, I remember in the, uh, see, I graduated from high school in 1959. Well, I remember I had a tutor, a guy named P.L. Gill. And old P.L. was really good at fixing his motorcycle. He was a good mechanic. But he was about the worst math student in the school. And I tutored PL. But that guy, he, he was the, probably the worst math student we had. Uh, but he still had to pass algebra, plane geometry, all the courses. He still had to get at least 70 on his exams. And he did, because he graduated from high school. And he was terrible at mathematics. Uh, sure, today they may say he has learning disability and stick him somewhere where he was never given a chance. That's a really poor math student. But all the math students, there's no, ch no one except the the severely mentally retarded who are in, in institutions being b bottle fed. I mean, they can't walk and talk or anything. They are not, they're, they're genetically disasters. Aside from those, everyone can learn simple mathematics. And most people who would be said like you're talking about not only can learn it, but they might be better at it.
Einstein is supposed to have done terribly at mathematics as, early, as, a, as a young man. Probably, might, maybe it had been a learning disability, who knows? <laughs> he looked at things differently. That's, see, that's something that even in science, people think, well, scientists know a lot of math, not a science, and of course, they stim they, 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 in science, they, especially with all the government money, everybody uh, uh, plays to this. They walk around the white coat, the furrowed brow, and the deep thoughts, you know, they're a special crowd. Really not, they're just specialists in particular areas, and if you really work in some area, you can absorb it almost regardless of your intelligence. But a really good one is not a man who's necessarily super brilliant. He's a man that looks at the world a little differently and is able to see something a little differently than people saw it before. A student that can work the math problems but not the normal way is probably more valuable than a student that works them the normal way. And so saying that a student has a learning disability is silly. Mm -hmm. But you were stuck with their rules, I know. Perfect. So you're a perfect student. You can teach yourself, even though you teach it a little differently. That's that's very. I mean, that's that's better than most students. You see. You're, you're still very young, so you can fix all that. And now, and you don't have to. You, I have a question. Is, so, I think it was dyslexia. Yeah. Because you know, there is actually you know, people who read these backwards or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't understand all the dyslexia. But, do you, I mean, what's your take on that? Well, I don't know a lot about it. I know the only ex experience I have is probably uh, Matthew, who did all his numbers backwards and all this stuff. He did it long enough that they'd have probably classified him and done something to him. Yeah, he wrote all the things, he wrote things from the wrong direction, and he wrote his numbers backwards and all this stuff. I just lived with it. I could figure it out, and we, after a while, he started writing them the other way. I didn't worry about it. I suppose there may be people who do this, you know, never get out of it, who never work their way out of it, and that would be something I don't have any experience with. But I expect you could teach him. I don't know. Well, they've just got a lot of words, which means that to cover their failures. The student fails, so I got a diagnosis. This is why he failed. It wasn't me. Let me give him some drugs and, and get some more money from the state for him. That's, that's just a racket. And it, yeah. I'm sorry. That's right, and that's what's not in the schools at all anymore, so you can't expect much better of them, unfortunately. Yes? I've got six kids, ages 3 to 11. It's just like I did. Yeah. One of my questions, because we got the curriculum back in the spring, and we haven't started yet, mm -hmm. we just want to make it unfair. How do I gauge where to start? By trial and error. Well, firstly, after up to a certain age, it doesn't matter. I'd say up to eight. They could just start at the beginning and do it all. When you get to 11, let's take math as an example. OK, uh, the 11-year-old the no doubt knows some math. And to make the 11-year-old go back and do 5-4, do the beginning math, might be wasteful because they already knew it and they'd be wasting their time. So if the child is older, you have to trial by trial and error start them at one point. And then if they have difficulty, because you can tell whether they're having difficulty, whether they get the problems right, how long it takes, or whether they can pass the exams on the stories they're reading or do the vocabulary, then if it's too hard, you back them up. If it's too easy, you go forward. In, uh, in the ages you have, you could almost start them all at the beginning. Uh, in math, for example, suppose that the child already knows everything that would be in the Math 5-4 book. If you use that little metering technique I mentioned, the student would be doing two lessons a day and be done with the book in two months anyway. So you have a quick review. 
So starting even an 11-year-old at the beginning of the math, if you realize that it's two lessons a day as everything is easy, doesn't hold them back. In the reading, uh, if they're a really fast reader, they'd probably just soak up all the initial books anyway. And if they get hung up in the vocabulary, then they needed the vocabulary, and so they're back where they belong. So probably at those ages, you could start them all at the beginning. The very oldest might benefit from skipping a little, but the stuff the child skipped probably wouldn't have taken too long to review anyway. And you must never skip any of the vocabulary. If they started on book 30, you've got to make sure they know all the vocabulary in books 29 back. And in the math, uh, unless, unless the 11-year-old was lucky and was in a program that had pretty good math, 5-4 may be about where he is, right? OK, well, then start them all at the beginning. But give them a chance to go really fast over the stuff they already know. Yeah. Yes. It takes, if you, firstly, the reason they're there is because if we gave you a book list and you had to search for them, that would kind of make it impractical. About 40% of them are out of print, and you'll have trouble finding them unless you're a used book, uh, you know, hobbyist. If you print them all, now the Encyclopedia Britannica, you probably wouldn't want to print. You'd probably just print pages you were interested in. You might have 80,000 pages to print over a 12-year period. And uh, so let's say you printed uh, uh, 9,000, well, 80,000 over a 12-year period. Suppose you print 6,000 pages a year, 7,000 pages a year, or something like this. A typical laser printer costs a little over a penny a page to print. So we're talking about a little less than $100 a year in printing costs. It beats having to go buy the books, which would be a lot more expensive. And if you value, if you, if you, if you budget, if you consider what your time is worth to find them, it probably beats that too. In addition, you probably don't have 80,000 because quite a few of the books are common books that you may have or maybe in your public library. So a normal person with a sort of average public library facilities getting the few things that are easy to get, maybe they're down to 60,000, which would be 5,000 a year, which would be $50, well, say 1.2 cents, would be $60 a year in printing costs for the ink and another little bit for the paper. So it's probably $100 a year in printing if you print, every, print most of everything. If a family has four kids, of course, they use the same book for each child, so you only print it once. You can read it on the screen, but we strongly recommend against that. Arnold uh, did the software, uh, the IBM software for it, and he put in some very nice on-screen readers. It gives a very high-quality image. It's easy to manipulate the pages. So it's, it's, the tools are provided to read it on the screen, but I strongly recommend against it because reading on a computer screen diminishes reading comprehension and reading speed. One of the reasons that we put it on the screen is some people want that. The other reason is that we're looking forward to what we think is coming, though it's not coming as fast as I'd expected it to, and that's uh, a, the technology where you'll have something you hold in your hand it looks like a book, feels like a book, but it's really a computer screen of high resolution. And when they have high resolution computer screens, you'll be able to dump the book in there. And if you can see something at 600 to 1200 dots per inch, even though it's a screen, it'll be as good as a book. I think that's where it's going. I don't think it'll be very many more years before you won't use paper anymore because the high resolution will be available on a holdable screen. But that hasn't come quite as fast as the magazine articles I read said it would. And a printed page is awfully nice. So you could spend up to $100. If you had one student, it could be up to $100 a year. If you were really efficient with your laser printer and spent a little time at the library, it'd probably be 50 When I figure out what it costs for a, uh, a family to do it, and then you, can add, then you can divide it by the number of children. Most homeschool families educate more than one child. But that's the order of magnitude of the cost. Now, if you do it wrong, it can be worse than that. If you use an inkjet printer, use lots of ink, it's very expensive, it's very slow, it gives a low resolution image, then it uh, can be two or three times that for poor copy. But the laser printers are almost as cheap as the inkjets today, 
a good one is three hundred dollars and new, and that's the way to do it. Yes, the Macintosh interface was written uh, as a volunteer project by a guy who spend, makes his living programming for Apple. He's very good. It is not, in my opinion, as nice on the screen as the IBM interface, but the Macintosh world is not quite as nice on the screen as the IBM interface. So uh, there's just the same set of CDs. It's the same set of CDs, but they get an extra disc that's got the Macintosh readers that refer to the CDs. So if I had two computers sitting there, one was a Mac and one was an IBM, and I do, I got a Mac so we could see our Mac version, I would, pref I would walk up and use the PC version because, I, of course, I'm familiar with that. I always use PCs in everything I do, and I prefer PC, I prefer the PC format, the Windows format. So I would use that in preference to the Macintosh, but the Macintosh interface works fine. Lots of people use it on Mac. About 10% of our buyers are Macintosh people, and they works fine. You get, if you get the Macintosh version, you also get the IBM version, because disk one has on it the IBM software. We distribute the Macintosh software on a separate disk because we just throw it in for the Mac users. So it, yes, it's completely usable, and if I had my choice, I'd use the other one, because I like the PC version better. But the access to everything is the same. And in fact, since you're, if you're considering just as a source to print the materials, it's identical. It's the, all this nice on-screen reader and stuff that Arnold built that's nicer in the Windows version. It's there in the Macintosh, but not quite as pretty. A definition and a use. You can. It's flashcards. We have flashcards in there for the arithmetic and flashcards for the vocabulary. And in the vocabulary, you, you can print out your own flashcards. There's also an on-screen flashcard system. Uh, my kids, in trying to learn vocabulary, found that the on-screen flashcards were harder to learn from. They're good flashcards. They flash up there. They do all you're supposed to do. But they just, staring at the screen, didn't teach them as fast as having the paper. Um, so you can print out the flashcards or otherwise. And the flashcards are of two types the word on one side and the definition on the other side, the word on one side and a sentence using the word on the other side, and the sentence is drawn from the book. See, all the words are key to the book, or two-thirds of the words are key to the book. When I went out and got this universe of SAT words and fitted it into the words from the books, many of them were already in the books, but about a third of the total words weren't in the books, and yet or at least we didn't know them to be in the books. We hadn't found them in the books. So we took that third and sprinkled them in all the books. So about two-thirds of the sentences are drawn from the book they just read, where the word is actually used. And about a third of them are made up because that word, we didn't at least know that it appeared in that book. And with the books in order of difficulty, the vocabulary just gradually gets harder, too, as the student goes along. And before any student takes the SAT, if he can do it, he should have memorized all 6,000 words. If he does, his verbal score is going to be an entirely different thing, because that's largely a vocabulary test. Grammar and vocabulary, but mostly vocabulary. I can comment on any particular situation or anything that somebody suggests and so forth, but I, I think the motivation, the discipline in the home varies a lot with the home and with the child and the parents. And the, the goal is the child has to sit there and do his job. I know that if a child sits in front of these materials or comparable materials, this isn't the only kind of stuff you can learn from, if he sits in a good study environment, and is asked to develop good study habits and is told what they are and is forced to sit there, he will develop them. The question is whether the home lacks the discipline to make him sit there. How you make him sit there is up to the home. I mean, my view is that when one of my kids, I mean, it's, in our home, it's unthinkable not to do what I ask. Maybe it should be thinkable, but it's not. Uh, I sometimes make mistakes, and if a child comes around and reminds me or I think about it, I'll correct my mistake. But they know if I say, oh, study your math for two hours every day and then do your writing and reading, 
no one would ever think of doing something else. If in that time when Joshua was in that thing where it was 12 hours a day till he got the idea and started doing his work, he didn't like being there. He was rebelling against getting the work done. But he never would have dreamed of leaving that desk. Not because his father was behind him with a belt, but because just in our home, that's the way it is. You do what you're told. How you achieve that point so the child doesn't squirm and go someplace else, that's a matter of being a parent that's not part of homeschooling. And you, you must achieve it because it may be cute when a 10-year-old flits around, if not cute when they're 17 and they've been allowed to do that, then they're out of control. Now it can be, and so, so you have to instill the discipline for a lot of other reasons. If people, when people talk to me about that and they say, you haven't said it that way, but they say, oh, my child couldn't do this, she just couldn't sit and study like this, then my conclusion is they have problems other than academic. They have to solve those problems before they can do the academics. The child has to be willing to do what he's told. Well, this is a prejudice, but I think it's well taken. We don't have any television, and we don't have any sugar in our home. Um, the television, well, we do have sugar, but not for the kids, all right? <laughs> we, don't, we don't have any television. That's easy. That's just a disaster, so we'd leave it out. We don't own one. For sugar, my wife and I, neither one of us ever got over our sugar addiction. And uh, this, I mean, sounds horrible, it's the truth. The children never have had sugar added to any of their food, and they will not eat food with sugar even if they're told to do it. The last time I remember them do, not doing what I told them to do was some years ago, some people came to visit us, and these people had done a lot for us, and they were really nice people, and I hated, I did not want to offend them. And this lady brought a big box of donuts and sweet rolls, and they were going to eat with us. And she puts them right in the middle of the table. And there are all the kids like little ten pens around the table. And here are these things she brought. And uh, I was looking at them. And finally, I said to the children, well, you could eat one if you like. Go, go ahead and eat one. I knew it wouldn't hurt them. One sweet roll, they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. Uh, the people were very angry. They, I mean, later. But, but the, uh, uh, we, however, Every now and then, Orly would sneak down to the, drive, the kitchen after everybody was asleep and make up a big batch of chocolate chip cookies, and she and I would eat them. <laughs> I have a problem because I do all the grocery shopping. And I have this sweet tooth, and I fight it, but it, I'm not always successful. I'm doing the grocery shopping. is that cookie thing, and I, I'll buy these cookies. Uh, my, his, his older brother, Zachary, when he was, I don't know, probably, probably 12, 13 or 14, I've got my cookie stash somewhere where I was working. Not always, but it's, it's there. And I notice my cookies are disappearing. And I think, now you've done it. You wanted to keep the kids off sugar, but you didn't kill your own habit. Now you brought the cookies in, and now they're hooked. Somebody's hooked, and they're stealing cookies, just like I stole cookies when I was a little kid. And uh, I try to track this down. Finally, my oldest son admitted it. He said, I've been taking them and throwing them away because you're more irritable when you're eating cookies. And it's true, people are more irritable when they eat sugar. But we spent, I spent a lot of my life doing research on nutrition, as did my wife, and we felt that it was better to raise children without added sugar. Of course, there's lots of sugar in your food. There's sugar in fruit, vegetables, there's sugar in everything you eat. It's not a question of sugar being bad, it's quantity. 20% of American calories come from sucrose, sugar. And it's the quantity which I believe is bad for your sugar metabolism and leads to various, and I've seen some effects of this. It tends to it tends to exacerbate hypoglycemia, a disease of sugar of rapidly changing blood sugar levels. And the best student I ever had was wiped out by hypoglycemia. He was a outstanding student, went to Rockefeller University with full fellowships, and a year later he was out of there. And I tracked him down and find out what he was doing, and he had no job and. I said, well, you want a job in the lab? He was the most best man I ever had in the lab. And so he said, well, I'll take the job, but I'm not the man I used to be. You'll be surprised. He came to the lab. He had all the skills he always had. He was a brilliant young man. But he had hypoglycemia, and his moods varied all over the map from the sugar he ate. Now, that's an extreme. And most people don't have that extreme, but I believe in children that their variability in mood and their uh, difficulties they have in life are exacerbated by eating sugar. That's a personal opinion. 
And so we decided to raise them without sugar, and I think that's better. Maybe that's why they're so quiet. <laughs> they, uh, now, this is not to suggest that these children have any special, I mean, when we, uh, we used to go to all-you-can-eat restaurants. We still do. It's a good deal, you know, when you have a lot of kids. And once, uh, two or three years after my wife died, the guy from our local all-you-can-eat restaurant came over, and he just said, I like having you here, but if you can't, if you can't keep from spilling so much food on the floor, don't bring your family back, right? I mean, <laughs> this is the father. There was no mother, right? The table manners were, were diminished. But at the same time, when we eat in restaurants, older people would come over and say, gee, your children are so well disciplined. They didn't understand that it was their job to stare the restaurant down. But they also were spilling stuff off their forks on the floor, see? So it's not that there's anything ideal about I think I have normal kids. But uh, I think children are better off not watching TV and not eating sugar. TV is a source of corrosive ideas, but it's also a tremendous waste of time. 